So what good can come from educating people on the self-simulation hypothesis, right? Because we started off with the doom and gloom and we're talking about our Blues Brothers mission from God here at QGR and trying to do good in the world and all that stuff. Well, this new scientific mythos or theory sprays out many helpful sub-theories. The word theory can be defined as a rational philosophy supported by one's interpretation of experiment. But every experience within consciousness is fundamentally an experiment. So we can say that a theory model or cosmology mythos about reality is a certain rationale based on one's mysterious experience of consciousness, one's existence. But make no mistake about it, theories are always philosophies. There are no proofs in physics just supporting evidence for this or that theory. In other words, educated philosophical guesses. One sub-theory goes like this. The transtemporal, pan-conscious substrate of an information-based physical reality would emerge at the top of a fully interactive fractal hierarchy of other conscious and infophysical subsystems like you and me. So I'll use infophysical a few more times in the, in the presentation, and that just means what we discussed, that the quantum picture tells us, or at least implies strongly, that that which we call physical, solids, you know, particles, is actually information at its most fundamental level. So I'll call that infophysical. But not all info is physical, right? Your experience of irony uh, is not infophysical. It's something else. So in the self-simulation hypothesis, principle of efficient language-based rules statistically guide a certain simple program to evolve this algorithm-driven simulation. That's the framework. Such that reality itself is deeply probabilistic and crystallizes into ontological realities based on observations which pluck experiences from the spread of probabilities given by the simple program. And then makes them informationally real. And the statistical tendency of these efficiency rules would be interpreted as physical laws of nature. The behavior of consciousness is to be aware and to think. But the things doing a lot of the thinking around here are biological systems like us. So we tend to think and create better if we enjoy energetic efficiency. In this view, energetic efficiency is going with the flow of the emergent game or simple program behavior with its physical probabilities, which are based on energy. So this is because the games that we have in mind at QGR will give quantum thermal dynamic probabilities. In other words, the more efficiently that your body and mind flow with physics, particularly quantum thermal dynamics, the more efficient and prolific your thinking and your creation will tend to be. So you are a subconsciousness in this picture of the emergent pan-consciousness substrate. We are therefore lesser consciousnesses that are emergent from and then emerge into greater strata of consciousness. 
So we are choosing our way via thoughts that are called observations through a discrete probabilistic spread of possible evolutions of information that we actualize into real information. In other words, possible information is not information. I could take David at a restaurant in Woodland Hills, but if I don't do it, it doesn't happen. In the world of information, there's a thought that I could think or somebody could think, but they're not real information yet until it's actualized into information by an entity capable of ascribing meaning or actualizing information that could be into information that is. So as we choose or steer our way through this probability landscape that is generated by our simple program and then held mathematically by the emergent substrate, our high-level thoughts, again called observations, actualize unreal infophysical possibilities into reality or real information called physicality. The rudders of this steering are actions of consciousness called observations. They are thoughts in the strictest sense of the term. Every measurement ever done is a thought within the consciousness of the experimentalist or observer. We choose when to observe, where to observe, and what to observe. Quantum mechanics shows us that each one of those observations changes the physical evolution of the universe itself. Notice what happens when you swim through your mental choices of observation and chosen physical actions in a way that allows this infophysical energy to flow more efficiently in accordance with how you might imagine a good quantum thermodynamics theory would dictate. What happens when you live this way? Well, you economize energy usage in your body, which can then be used for better health and more thinking and helpful creation of physical systems and more learning about the nature of reality. Obviously, this symbiotic flow is not how the current mythos guides us to run our biosphere. For better or worse, humans are now running Earth's biosphere. We are stewards of the highest order. But we're using our power to destroy. And does our power come from our superior teeth or our strength? No, it comes from our superior power of abstraction. Put differently, humans have outrageously high consciousness. There's never been anything like it here. In one third the age of the visible universe, we have had 100 million species on this planet. And there has never been one capable of putting its technology on Mars or discovering quantum mechanics or making a mythos that gives us collective permission to quickly change the symbiosis of the biosphere via chemical changes to the atmosphere, oceans, and mass extinctions. So it is through the power of our consciousness that we have managed to do what we have done to the biosphere and been able to achieve so far a full 25% of us with a mental illness. That's not encoded in our DNA to have one out of four adults with a diagnosable mental illness. Any extraordinary power can be used for harm or good to influence those more innocent life forms that contribute to the overall organism of our biosphere.
So what does this mean to efficiently learn, create, and swim our way through the quantum thermal dynamic possibility space? Well, as physical life forms, it means to follow what your DNA guides, which is symbiosis with all of the subsystems within your body and mind and the subsystems of the biosphere around you. That's how you're programmed. It took four billion years to get that programming to where it is. Your desire to sleep at a certain time is a circadian rhythm encoded in your DNA just as many other natural flows in your body are programmed. Only a remarkably intelligent and abstract thinking animal can override the guidance of the genetic code to live out of symbiosis internally, mentally, internally, and externally. Over four billion years, DNA coding evolved with quantum thermal dynamics and gravitational forces to produce breathtaking efficiency. You'd have to be an extremely conscious animal to override this coding. My dogs are smart, but not smart enough to override their genetic coding. To simplify further, it means to be in flow and harmony with your body and your internal thoughts, and to be in energetic synergy with both the living and non-living systems around you. Some unnatural things we invent with our novel power of abstraction lead to mental and physical health problems, not to mention the almost collapsed Jenga tower that is our teetering biosphere. Does our DNA guide us to drive ourselves to cardiovascular disease as we overwork to get Gucci shoes versus equal off-brand shoes or a three-car garage home versus a two-car one? Does it drive us to build weapons of mass destruction or burn down most of the rainforests? Or do these unnatural behaviors stem from an antiquated materialism abstraction that no longer serves us and probably never did. Saved energy from this more synergistic physical efficiency of planetary and societal symbiosis would free up more energy to produce higher order emergent things. If humans quickly use our outsized and strikingly abstract minds to snap out of our delusional mythos and become symbiotic with one another and the rest of the biosphere, we will not drive off the apocalypse cliff just inches before we propel to our death. I believe a certain realistic future quantum thermal dynamic and quantum gravity theory will turn out to be trans-temporal and open up interesting ontological possibilities, such as the self-simulation hypothesis. This trans-temporal or a cross-time feedback loop that seeks quantum thermal dynamic efficiency is something we called a strange loop in our paper. This biosphere is a living organism, collectively swimming through a sea of choices of what to measure, when and where to measure, and how to measure. I'm not saying that the organism of the Earth is necessarily observing. It's hard to say what observation really is, but it is known nowadays that the entire Earth is itself a living organism in the way that biologists define it. It self-regulates itself. It's like the whole thing is kind of like a plant or an animal that self-regulates and adjusts. So we don't know what consciousness is again, but we know things that it does. 
such as choosing. And we can choose many future timelines that exist in the probability distribution ahead of us. Consciousness has the lofty role of choosing or steering our way through the possibility space of timelines, some of them fun and some downright apocalyptic. Each path is one of many worlds of unreal infophysical possibility that become real infophysical when we observe or choose them. The chosen ones become abstract information or thought in the pan-consciousness substrate. They become real when observed, in other words, when thought of. That may sound confusing since the philosophy of materialism is a subconscious bias in our minds. In the materialism-grounded philosophy called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, the real stuff is the opposite of information. It is the stuff that just is and is called material, energy, or physicality. And the real thing in the Copenhagen interpretation is called the possibility space, or the spread of possible things that could become real if and only if someone observes them. In that interpretation, our observations make the unreal information physical, or non-information, upon observation. That's Copenhagen. So in that interpretation, it has some of the stuff that is made of information, which is the probability spread given by the Schrodinger equation. But it's not real. It's like not ontologically real. It's just possible to be real if and only if a consciousness comes along and plucks parts of it to become physical, to become the stuff that just is. So that's the possibility space. And possibilities we observe crystallize information that is unreal into physicality, again, the stuff that just is, and becomes real when it is observed. In the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, the entire possibility space of worlds described by the Schrodinger equation are converted into material, the stuff that just is. There is no dual picture of the possibility space information that's not real and then the stuff that becomes physical when observed. In Everett's many worlds, he takes the whole damn possibility space given by the Schrodinger equation and just says, all of it is physical. It's just different worlds. It is not just possibilities made of information. It's physical stuff in Everett's picture of the unitary evolution, right? Cranked out by the Schrodinger equation. So that's a hyperphysical view. So you can kind of think as Schrodinger and th that view as being having this one foot in information where information's really important in their theory, but it's not real, not physical, and then stuff crystallizes into realness upon observation. Then that's, that's one foot in one world and one foot in the other. And then you got Everett who takes materialism religion to its extreme and says, hey, the whole damn thing is physical. It's just that there's all these other universes that are physical and real countless numbers of them, all described by the Schrodinger wave equation. So, so it takes that materialism philosophy even further than Copenhagen, which um, the Copenhagen has a dash of materialism and a sprig of abstract informationalism. So in the self-simulation hypothesis, it's different. Everything that is real is information. There is no label in that viewpoint called material. We just have no use for it, no motivation, no evidence. Just information that could exist, 
so it's not real. And then information that does exist if actualized by an entity capable of making it real by ascribing meaning. Think of your consciousness as the entity that cruises through the spread of probabilities laid out by a quantum gravity theory and then sprays awareness or observation on some of it in a creative way because you get to choose a lot of your way through it all. Thereby, with your spray of observation, making subnetworks of this possibility space real. In other words, info-physical. So we have the information that could exist and be labeled as physical or real if and only if it gets actualized into real info by observation. And then we have the information that is unreal because it hasn't been observed or actualized into information in the first place by an entity capable of ascribing meaning. In both the popular Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics and the self-simulation hypothesis interpretation, it is observation that takes the thing that is unreal and makes it real or physical. Again, the difference is that the Copenhagen interpretation says information is unreal and it becomes real upon observation, while the self-simulation hypothesis interpretation of quantum mechanics says that unobserved information is not real since consciousness actualizes possible information into the real world of actual information. Another sub-theory of the self-simulation hypothesis that has helped me in business and science is to trust the flow of intuition. So maybe intuition is the experience of a fleeting moment of trans-temporal connection with our future and past selves, where the experience itself is the strange loop that we wrote about in our SSH paper a spontaneous co-creation thought between all the stages over the time domain of an evolution of a consciousness. Like you kind of go non-local for a, just a fleeting moment and tap into that. High levels of emergent consciousness, such as yourself, live in an interactive hierarchy of other complex subsystems of the universe that can be conscious as well. Your ego or sense of self is part of this network that composites up to form the future pan-consciousness substrate. So according to the SSH, your ego and its creative choices of thought are necessary, along with everything else, in order for the pan-consciousness substrate of the future to emerge in the first place so that reality can logically exist. So think of yourself like an atom of simpler consciousnesses. I mean, that's a single-celled organism, right? And so you're made of a bunch of those little guys. So you emerge from them. So these little things that interresonate with other consciousnesses to form the emergent pan-consciousness substrate. Like, think of eight billion of us, plus our ancestors, plus our countless descendants going into deep time. And think of the possibility of some future quantum gravity theory allowing a sort of neural network architecture in space-time. A, a, it would have to be a non-local space-time theory. And if such a theory could exist and comport fully with quantum mechanics, it could open up possible hypotheses about the networking of multiple consciousnesses across time to form super consciousnesses or emergent consciousnesses. So this would be like in the same way that a single celled life form in your body mind system uh, will team up with a lot of other single celled little guys and how they team up is you, the emergence of Israelness. Right? This thing we can't define, but we can at least know that it emerges from simpler things. And then those little guys are in some sense, for lack of a better word, interresonating 
right? They're in a kind of co-influence relation or feedback loop with one another. And from all of that network of inter-resonation or relationships, the emergent uber consciousness of your mind emerges. So sure, these little guys have organelles, they reproduce, they actually make primitive choices, they do run from noxious substances, and they do chase nutrients, and they do excrete. They're little ant life forms. But they're not nearly as smart as you, way up high at the collective emergent level of your body and mind. Similarly, a non-local quantum gravity theory might allow consciousness to connect across space and time to form some new flavor of consciousness that is as much smarter than us as we are compared to those little single-celled animals that collectively emerge into us and our minds. So our egos have access to our limited learned knowledge that is stored in our animal bodies, our brains, right? There is no scientific consensus on what ego or consciousness is and mankind does not have a predictive quantum gravity theory that allows for minds to be connected across time. So who can blame anyone for being overly convinced um, that intuition has nothing to do with a strange loop from the future and, you know, for believing that it is a mere circumstantial epiphenomenon of certain mammals. Certainly what I would have said some years ago. So intuition will therefore be brushed off to make room for more limited local physics logic that fits squarely within the cage of our incomplete picture of physics. As we navigate the last few hundred meters toward the edge of the apocalypse cliff that we're heading toward, we're probably leaving a lot of opportunity on the table by restricting ourselves to a mind space that is devoid of non-local intuition from the future. So maybe we need to team up a bit with our descendants, somehow. But to even try to do that, you would have to take a leap of theoretical faith. But that's what science is, right? Having faith without proof that a philosophy is probably correct because you have some rationale that implies for you that it is correct. And if you're willing to go so far as to trust your gut or intuition, you can throw that on top of the rationale. In other words, you know, you can have evidence for something that's strong and then you can have other evidence that you call your gut instinct or intuition. So I have learned from the self-simulation hypothesis not to overly worship logic and linear thinking because it causes me to lose the connection with the other parts of the flow ahead of me in time, where a supposed mistake back here in the past often turns out to be a blessing up there in the future. The across time flow of guidance within consciousness that I call intuition. The lesson for me is to trust intuition. It is a manifestation of the cross-time feedback loops that our paper explains. The thermodynamically efficient flow through the path of intuitional signposts leads to higher achievements of your own emergent consciousness and the goals that you might have in this life. So we can use some higher achievements right around now as we head into 2023. And I think if we leave intuition as just like Santa Claus, something some people believe in, but that seems not real, then we're probably um, not maximizing our odds to get out of this pickle. So relax in your life in general. Tune into the thermodynamic flows that you can easily sense if you listen and learn to dial into this signal that I call the non-local intuitional flow. Ride these waves across time. But you might need to wake your intuition up if you have atrophied it 
by just snuffing it out for years with old school local physics based linear logic stories and the philosophy of materialism. Perhaps you barely feel the subtle flows of thermal dynamic efficiency trying to nudge you out of your mentally constructed habits like staying up all night looking at the computer and rarely exercising or finding the time each day for mental relaxation known as non-thinking. So if you want to know what correct thermodynamic and DNA guided flow looks like, study how a cat flows, both in terms of its decisions and its physical movement, like fluid with very little artificial mental rigidity. Be healthy and in unselfish harmony with the world around you and trust your intuition. These are two of the countless helpful sub-theories we can benefit from by understanding and just thinking about the self-simulation hypothesis. Because things are changing faster in some not-so-fun ways, mankind must move quickly to discover a newer mythos that leads to less selfish and destructive behavior. The uber mission of quantum gravity research is to be of service in the last days of a hair-raising adventure movie, here in the 11th hour as we approach the edge of an apocalyptic cliff. The self-simulation hypothesis is nothing less than a replacement of the old theories of ancient religions and Greek philosophies. And as discussed, materialism has a similarity to religion because it does not explain the origin of material or energy. And like religions, its answers are, it just is. There is no origin. The self-simulation hypothesis cosmology doesn't say that. It just doesn't say the pan-consciousness just is. It explains the origin, and it doesn't say that physicality or even the pre-physical math just is. It explains the origin. So if widely adopted as a more sophisticated and reasonable view of reality, it would be the death now of the dusty old philosophy called materialism that has no evidence to justify its utterly complete grip on the educational and governmental systems guiding our collective stewardship of this biosphere. It is a new worldview that places information and therefore consciousness at the head of the table as the foundational substrate of reality. Poetically, it's the unification of the theories of matter, which is physics, and the theories of consciousness, which are theories of spirituality. It's a more helpful and true mythos or theory at a time where the old stories of materialism and organized religion have failed and conspired to lead us on the current unsustainable path toward destruction. So one of the biggest tasks of quantum gravity research is stimulating a global debate over the self-simulation hypothesis.